energy and natural resources under the theme charting fees mining vision and the future of illegal mining here at the Shiller's Executive Hotel today, the 15th of May in the year 2024. My name is Abdul Hayy Momen. I work at the University for Development Studies as the Director of Public Affairs, and I'm excited to have chosen to moderate this very important occasion. For events like this at the University for Energy and Natural Resources, we always invite the presence of the good Lord. And to do that invitation for us, I will humbly invite the university's chaplain to lead us in the opening prayer. Let's give the chaplain a round of applause. Shall we humbly rise in prayer? We pray in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, this morning we stand here with a heart of gratitude and appreciation, thanking you for the gift of life, thanking you for making it possible that we see this event commence. We thank you so much for genuine mercies granted each and every one of us from far and near. Thank you because we stand here not because we drove in the best of cars. We are here not because we flew the best of flights, neither did we walk on the best of roads. But your mercies and your grace has carried us on your eager wings to this place safely. We therefore say, hallowed be your name. It is by this same wisdom we entrust the success of this program into your able hands. For Bible says that you that has begun a good work in us, you surely seek to the completion of it. Therefore, take preeminence, lead us, O God, that after this program, we all shall be capacitated unto every good and perfect work. Speak through our resource persons, speak through our special guests, and may we all be motivated to do that which will bring glory and honor to this university, to this region, and to the nation Ghana at large. We know you are able to do exceedingly, abundantly far above all that we ask, think, or imagine. And therefore we pray that you will name alone be glorified, that we live here filled with joy, knowing that you are still in the business of doing something great and marvelous for this nation. We pray that this effectual door open unto this university shall lead us to greater doors, that at the end of everything, we shall say it is your doing and so marvelous in our sight. We have asked all this not in any ordinary name, but in the name that commands heaven, the name that rules on earth and has dominion even in hell, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Have I prayed with thanksgiving? Let me hear your amen. amen. I thought we were going to give the chaplain a round of applause for inviting the presence of the good Lord to this event. But why are we here? Why were we all invited here? And especially, why did the University for of Energy and Natural Resources invite His Excellency, the former president, and the presidential candidates of the NDC here today, amongst others, to speak to us? In order to put the conversations here in perspective, I humbly invite the chairman of the Governing Council of the University of Energy and Natural Resources, Professor Gwesi Nsia Jaba, to give us the welcome address. Thank you. Your Excellency, the former President of the Republic of Ghana, John Draman Mahama, who is also the presidential candidate for the National Democratic Congress, NDC, in the coming, upcoming national elections. Former ministers of state in the company of His Excellency, the former president, members of parliament present, national chairman of NDC, members of the National Executive Council of NDC present, regional chairman, and his regional executives of the NDC president. Members of the Governing Council of the University of Energy and Natural Resources, vice chancellors of sister universities present, faculty, staff, students of the university, chiefs 
and traditional leaders, members of the mining industry, both large and small scale, metropolitan, municipal, and district chief executives present, members of the diplomatic corps online and present, members of the Ghana National Association of Small Scale Miners present, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I have a unique and singular honor to welcome all of you to the third annual transformational dialogue on small scale mining. The theme for this year's dialogue is charting our country mining vision and the future of illegal mining. It has become the talk of the world today, both in ink and electronics and speeches in the forms of allegories, idioms, and insinuations. The wake of looming demand for critical minerals has induced a more than anticipated scramble for new destinations for mineral resources development investment and supplies. Targeted supplies destinations are obviously Africa and Asia. In fact, the developing countries. Your Excellency, the University of Energy and Natural Resources, in its own wisdom and by the tenets of its mandate, has decided to ignite the conversations in order to confront a looming danger ahead of us. What is this looming danger? For us globally, Industrialized countries are busy strategizing through conferences, webinars, seminars, and conventions on ways to optimize their investment in the mineral resources development space in Africa. The clouds are seen high above the skies of African countries that we are unprepared. We are non-strategic and at the mercy of resource economics bullying. So the developed countries are bullying us. They are coming to us, take their resources away, and leave us with nothing. While the developed and highly industrial countries are busy developing, refining, and advancing strategies to consolidate their mining sector business with us, we do not seem to be Lazing our boots to leverage our opportunities. Your Excellency, critical minerals will become even more important as the world seeks to bolster its energy security and domestic industrial resilience. The University of Energy and Natural Resources could not be more relevant than in this current dispensation of critical minerals for renewable and sustainable energy conservation, consumption, and production. Thus, the overall objective of this year's multi-stakeholder dialogue is to ignite the conversation on developing our country's mining vision to ensure that Ghana's mineral wealth supports sustainable development and contributes to sustainable development and prosperity. Your Excellency, in February 2009, heads of states of member countries of the African Union met and adopted the groundbreaking proposal for the establishment of the African Mining Vision. The African Mining Vision, in its implementation plan, instigates all member countries to develop their country mining vision and synchronizes with that of the African mining vision. 15 years today, Ghana does not have a mining vision. Your Excellency, the University of Energy and Natural Resources has an interest because its mandate is to optimize the natural resources sector that will catapult sustainable development in all sectors of the economy. Through human resource capacity development, research, and outreach, 
We particularly express interest in artisanal and small-scale mining because part of our mandate is to proffer mechanisms for poverty alleviation. Many scientific works, including the Yaoundé Declaration in 202, consider artisanal and small-scale mining as a pro for policy or activity. Your Excellency, I therefore expect that this year's consultative dialogue will help to fasten a positive, balanced, and competitive mining vision for our beloved country. This, I believe, will generate optimum benefits from our mineral resources. But I know that the success of a Ghana country mining vision will depend largely on a national consensus to fulfill its underlying principles, our goals, and our strategies. Hence, I welcome all stakeholders to come on board and work with us to achieve this historic feat. With a country mining vision in place and faithfully implemented and well executed by 2030, Ghana's mineral sector will be modern, diversified, efficient, and attractive. Our country mining vision will support the implementation of Africa mining vision by providing the enabling environment for the achievement of the desired outcomes. I particularly call on the Minister of Lands and Natural Resources, Ghana Chamber of Mines, Minerals Commission, and the Ghana National Association of Small Scale Miners to collaborate with national agenda. It is clear within our context that mining is necessary to meet the needs and aspirations of our current and future generations. The sector will be fundamental to Ghana's becoming a place of choice to live place of choice to work, the place of choice to raise families, and the place of choice to do business. Your Excellency, I want to assure artisanal and small-scale miners that there is enormous variation in the roles the University of Energy and Natural Resources can play, depending on your industry needs, depending on your business model and how you coordinate your relationships with us and the context in which you operate. There is one thing I can reassure you, which is the academia cannot support illegal mining. We have a responsibility to ensure that the future of illegal mining is excellent, history, and void. Thus, University of Energy and Natural Resources strategy towards embracing the mandate in the challenging times of the world's natural resource development and also governance is through establishment of relevant schools and departments. Currently, the university comprises of nine tailored schools. These are School of Energy, School of Natural Resources, School of Engineering, School of Art and Social Sciences, School of Sciences, School of Agriculture and Technology, School of Graduate Studies, School of Geosciences, and School of Mines and Built Environment. The School of Mines and Built Environment is a temporary combination, School of Built Environment and the School of Sustainable Minerals and Mines. Your Excellency, our strategy sets out our plan to secure our mandate by boosting domestic capacity and capability. This strategy will generate new knowledge, will generate new jobs, will generate new wealth and new investment attraction, and will play a lead role in solving critical national challenges of our resource development. 
we can only do this in close partnership with government, industry, and other relevant stakeholders in energy and natural resources. Through relevant partnerships, we want to establish our school of minds as a skills leader and continue to undertake cutting edge research and innovation in exploration, mining, refining, and recycling in a way that creates jobs and growth and protects communities and our natural environment. To this end, the school has introduced the following academic programs of national relevance and importance. BSc Sustainable Mining, BSc Urban Mining, BSc Development Minerals Mining, BSc Sustainable Land Management, MSc and MPhil Land Degradation and Neutrality, and PhD in Land Sustainable Land Management. Many other programs of critical national relevance and importance are pending accreditation by the Ghana Tertiary Accreditation Commission. Our major challenge is financial clearance to employ relevant staff who undertake research and teach our students. From the gold and bauxite that placed Ghana at the forefront of industrial revolution to the critical minerals essential to the new green industrial revolution, University of Energy and Natural Resources will now be a leading player in the global race for critical minerals. This strategy of the university will help us create a more secure, resilient supply chains needed for a clean, safe, and prosperous future. In summary, Your Excellency, this year's program comprises of four panel discussions and participants' interactive sessions which we simply acronyze as PIs. Panelists will shed light on various sub-themes as follows. One, brain stop storming the aspirations and ambitions of a Ghana mining mission. Two, models for access to financing small-scale mining in Ghana. Three, providing sustainable backbone support for the realization of a Ghana mining vision. And fourth, the functional roles and responsibilities of stakeholders in a sustainable Ghana mining vision. The panelists shall comprise of representatives from the following parliamentary select committees. Mines and Energy, Environment, Lands and Forestry, and constitutional and legal affairs. We also have representatives from the regulatory bodies, namely House of Chiefs, large and small scale mining bodies, communities, civil society organizations, academia, trade union congress, a range of professional bodies such as Sakura Mining Network, Women in Mining Ghana, and various financial institutions dotted throughout the country. At the end of the deliberations, a communique shall be issued. We will also disseminate a comprehensive report to all relevant and participating bodies in the dialogue. Our major challenge is following up and providing feedback for effective implementation of action areas. We need the cooperation of all stakeholders, including those of you present, Nananum, the rest of civil society, to take part in this activity. Your Excellency, we wish to thank you and the members of various organizations public agencies, private sector and professional organizations, 
non-governmental organizations and community groups for coming to engage in the consultative process that's so critical to our country's mining vision. Your Excellency, I'm grateful for your audience and I duly welcome you to the University of Energy and Natural Resources. Under normal circumstances, we should host you on our campus. But unfortunately, we do not have a befitting auditorium to host you and your team on our campus. It is therefore my humble that your excellence facilitates such a facility for us so that by your next visit in your new capacity as the president of the Republic of Ghana we will be inaugurating an ultra modern and magnificent auditorium that befits a modern day university with such a huge potential for growth and development in our country. Thank you, sir. God bless you. God bless Mother Ghana. God bless each and every one of us here. We truly appreciate the fact that you left off your businesses, especially in this hectic election year. You've also left your busy schedules and other equally important assignments just because the University of Energy and Natural Resources has called you to come for consultations. We love you as you love the University of Energy of Natural Resources. For us, it is an invaluable gesture that you have shown us and we truly appreciate it. Thank you, sir. And welcome. Thank you very much. Chairman of the University Governing Council, Professor Kwesi Nsia Jabba, deserves another round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen. Your Excellency, with your permission, I'd like to draw your attention to some of the individuals and groups who are here to listen to you and the other speakers today. Uh, in no particular order, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Madame Millicent Yeboah. Madame Millicent Yeboah is a parliamentary candidate for Tsunyai West. I have also seen the former Chief of Staff under the Presidency of His Excellency John Dramatama. Mr. Julius Debra, former Chief of Staff, is here with us. I have also seen on our high table Honorable Vincent Opon Asamoah. Honorable Vincent Opon Asamoah is the MP for Doma West. He is also the chairman of the Bono Council Caucus of NDC in Parliament and the ranking member he works of the Works and Housing Committee in Parliament. We are grateful to you. Uh, I have also seen Professor Opuni Frimpong. Professor Opuni Frimpong is the former Pro Vice Chancellor of the University for Energy and Natural Resources. Ladies and gentlemen, I've also seen Dr. Tony Orban. Dr. Tony Orban is a former CEO of the Minerals Commission. I will now introduce to you a lady who later on I will still be introducing to you, but for the purposes of this introduction, I'd like to say that she, we all know at some point, in fact, she's a lawyer, an astute lawyer, she is also a former Minister for Justice and Attorney General. She is also a former Minister for Education, Mrs. Betty Bold Idrisu. 
In fact, this is Betty Mohdi. I call her Auntie Betty. That's why I had to pause. You know, introduce you as Mrs. Betty Mohdi. Uh, we also have Ambassador Kojo Nyameche Mafo, the Buno Regional Chairman, NDC. Of course, a while ago, uh, we were addressed by Professor Kwesi Nsia Jaba. Professor Kwesi Nsia Jaba is the chairman of the governing council of the university. And I've also seen Professor Jonas Ugu Ayalabula of the School of Mines and Built and responsible for the organization of Let's give him a round of applause. We also know that the Vice Chancellor's Ghana has sent a representative here in the person of Mr. Imo Rohadi. We are grateful to you. Representatives from other universities are also here. I've seen reps from the University for Development Studies. Uh, yeah, just give us a wave. Thank you so very much. Our traditional uh, leaders who are also here. We are very grateful for your presence. All the NDC parliamentary candidates who are here, just give us a wave. Let's know you are here. They are here in their numbers. Thank you so very much. And um, we'll move on to take some um, remarks from the, the partners to this event have the honor of inviting the rep of UNIDO, if you are here. Rep of UNIDO. I've also seen, sorry, Uncle Alex. Alex Mould is here with us. Uh, let's give uh, Uncle Alex a round of applause. Thank you so very much. Uh, if UNIDO is not here, I will now invite the rep of uh, UNESCO, the rep of UNESCO, to give us a round of uh, uh, message, a fraternal message. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you so very much. Good morning to you all. I bring you greetings from the United Nations office in Ghana, specifically UNESCO. I'm delivering a message on behalf of the UNESCO representative to Ghana. Mr. Edmond Mukala. I am Prosper Nyavo, the head of education at the UNESCO office in Ghana. I want to stand on the protocols that have been established by Professor Nsian Jaba in order not to miss out anybody and be fined for it. It is an honor to join you today for this important dialogue on small scale mining in Ghana. The theme for the dialogue, charting our country's mining vision and the future of illegal mining is appropriate. And it is in tune with the African mining vision, which was mentioned by the chair of the University Council. This vision was developed by the African Union in 2009 to ensure that the continent utilizes its mineral resources strategically for broad-based inclusive development. The dialogue that we are having today resonates with Ghana's SDG targets as well as the UN Sustainable Development Corporation Framework for Ghana, in which the UN system in Ghana identifies rising level of illegal mining and its associated deforestation and adverse impacts on the environment water bodies, agricultural land use as issues that need to be tackled with a sense of urgency. Mr. Chairman, the small-scale mining sector has long been a cornerstone of Ghana's economy, providing livelihood to thousands while contributing significantly to national revenue. However, the sector has faced persistent challenges prominent among them being the issue of illegal mining. The scourge of illegal mining, commonly known as Galamse, has cast a shadow over Ghana's natural resources, threatening the environment, the health, and well-being of the citizens. 
While the efforts by the media, CSOs, and the government to curb the menace is commendable, you will agree with me that we are very far from winning the battle. It is therefore gratifying to see the University of Energy and Natural Resources initiating an important dialogue like this, which is also focusing on the broader issue of charting a mining vision for the country. It is important to state that the AU's, mining, the AU's African mining vision recognizes the important contribution of artisanal and small-scale mining to local economic development and promotion of women's rights. The challenge is for member states, including Ghana, to figure out how to domesticate the AU's vision, taking into consideration the national laws, traditional institutions, cultural values, and how the communities of these countries are organized. It is therefore important that discussions on the, on the immediate and long-term consequences of illegal mining and how to curb it should not be restricted to formal events like this. These discussions must also be taken to our local communities, especially in the mining area, where the community members are directly bearing the brunt of this menace. Many of the actors also live in these communities and are known by the residents of these communities. Why national policy frameworks are important in this fight, indigenous knowledge is equally important. At UNESCO, recognize the urgency of addressing these challenges head on. Our mandate to promote sustainable development through education, science, culture, and communication positions us as a key partner in the fight against illegal mining. Through our expertise and partnerships, we stand ready to support Ghana in charting a path towards a sustainable mining vision for the future. Education is at the heart of UNESCO's approach by raising awareness about env the environmental, social, and economic impacts of illegal mining we empower communities to make informed choice and advocate for responsible mining practices. Education also plays a vital role in fostering innovation, entrepreneurship, thereby offering alternative livelihoods to those who are engaged in illegal mining. Our approach is also informed by culture Cultural heritage should play a crucial role in shaping Ghana's mining vision by recognizing the intrinsic value of traditional knowledge and practices. We can ensure that mining activities respect and preserve the cultural heritage of affected communities. Cultural heritage can, preserve, can serve as a catalyst for sustainable development, fostering pride, and identity while promoting responsible stewardship of natural resources. In conclusion, the challenges posed by illegal are daunting, but they are not unsurmountable. With collective action and a shared vision, we can chart a course towards a mining sector that is economically prosperous, environmentally sustainable, and socially inclusive. UNESCO and the UN system in Ghana are ready to support Ghana on this journey of charting a mining vision for Ghana and thereby finding solutions for the Karamse menace. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, exactly uh, four years ago, it was also an election year, and I was working as a journalist, and I recall that at the time there was a major debate between the two main political parties, the NDC and the MPP, which had to do with one village, one dam. The debate was whether or not the MPP had provided dams or dugouts in villages in northern Ghana. As a journalist, 
I took it upon myself to find out, to go to the grounds, to find out exactly what was on the grounds, present the picture to the Ghanaian, for the Ghanaian public to decide whether or not there were dugouts or indeed dams had been provided. My team and I were provided with a pickup truck to drive from Accra all the way to any community we chose. So we randomly chose some communities, beginning from Nabdam in the Upper East region. When we got to Nabdam, uh, we just went to a community. And as journalists, what we do is we do what we call a community entry. So we looked for an assemblyman. We asked for the assemblyman. Uh, he was an elderly man, perhaps in his 70s. And we told him the purpose for which we had come there. We told him that we were there indeed to find out if they had been provided a dam in that community. He said, well, the government had provided something. As whether it's a dam or a dugout, you go and find out for yourselves. But, but we went with a, a pickup. So we said, sir, uh, can we go in our car? He says, oh, no, it's just a stone throw from here. It's just a stone throw from here. And that was the key word, stone throw. So we said, so we don't need the vehicle. He said, no, let's walk. We started walking. When a villager tells you it is not far, it is very far. So we walked. Five minutes into the journey, we're still walking. Ten minutes into the journey, we're still walking. But I had also been told that the, the dams were about three kilometers from each village, you know, that kind of thing. But we had walked for more than five kilometers. So I said, sir, you said the dam was just a stone thrower. Then he said, young man, you should have asked me who threw the stone in the first place. But I'm excited to be here. I think I deserve a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, this was just to get your attention back so I can introduce the next set of um, dignitaries who are here with us. The Registrar of the University of Energy and Natural Resources is Dr. Mrs. Georgina Esi Owusu. She's here with us. Let's give her a round of applause. Dr. Peter Apiahene is a council member. He's here with us. Ni Ajete Kofi Mensa is the president of the Ghana National Association of Small Scale Miners. And he's here with us. Let's, where's Ni? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Ni didn't come alone. He came with all his members. The members of the Ghana National Association of Small Scale Miners. Just give us a wave. Let's acknowledge your presence here. You are here in your numbers. Uh, we are very grateful to you. We also have Professor Kenneth Pepra, director. Uh, SDD UBIT uh, from WA, you are here, we are grateful to you. Uh, Professor Samuel Kobina is uh, from the University for Development Studies. Professor Benis Esiedu is with the UNER and Dr. Emmanuel Opokumafo is also here with us. We are very, very grateful to you. Um, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, time now to listen to the speaker for the day. Usually, when, as MCs, we get the opportunity to introduce persons of the caliber of our speaker, what we usually begin by saying is that, especially when the person is a popular person, we say this person needs no introduction. But when we say the person needs no introduction, what we are actually saying is that these persons are among the persons in our communities, in our societies, in our country, who have achieved so much that their achievements become a matter of public attention. It's such a woman that I'm about to introduce to you. I've already indicated to you that she is a former minister of state in charge of education, in charge of uh, uh, justice and attorney general. But more importantly, for me, as a person, she is a mother. And when mothers are in charge, they take care of everything. I'm happy to invite our mother, my mother, our minister, incoming and outgoing, 
Mrs. Betty Mould Idrisu. Incoming President of Ghana. No shaking. <laughs> Our colleagues, former ministers of state, my colleagues, and chairman, members of the governing council of the University of Energy and Natural Resources, learned faculty members present, those present from other campuses and from other universities, other um, distinguished colleagues here of the National Democratic Congress and other parties that might be present, our uh, revered and esteemed chiefs, Nananum Yamamuakwabo, I am so delighted to be here. And also, I see students here. Students, where are you? Great. They are the bedrock of our future. And they are the ones we are appealing to now. Not only because this is the time for fresh uh, voters to be registered. Remember your civic duty and do go and register in the, in the current uh, registration exercise. If you have attained the age of 18 and above, and if you are not already on the register. Your Excellency, I find, as a lawyer, having to talk about the future of illegal mining rather difficult. So what is illegal is illegal. What we are going to do today is to let our incoming president chart his path, his vision towards how we will do it better as a government in terms of dealing with the issue of small-scale mining. I am going to talk today as an academic, you know, I was a lecturer before, uh, before I became a minister, and indeed the drafting of the bill for the establishment of the university ironically started when I was the Minister for Justice and Attorney General. And um, this is Christine, Dr. Christina Mahapunyama's committee was set up by our late president, uh, may he rest in peace, Professor Mills. And um, we saw the bill through cabinet. In 2010, it wasn't easy to get public universities recognized as being a fundamental part of our development plan. And I can assure you, and I'm sure uh, 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 President John Dramani Mahama will also assure you that there should be a university in every region of Ghana. So again, when the bill for the establishment of the university was finally laid in Parliament, I was privileged then to be Minister of Education with a co-junct responsibility to appear and defend the bill before Parliament, the Parliamentary Select Committee. And I think that's why I'm here today, because we started it, and we couldn't have done it without the vision of the NDC government and without the vision of the ministers, the presidency, and all of those in academia who, who supported us. Here we are today. It could be much better, but it's going to be much better. So you'll forgive me if I speak intellectually as a former minister of education and maybe touch on one or two issues of law. Your Excellency, we have heard that education is a national priority. I know that it is your national priority in your incoming government, requiring strong political will, and we will we will be able to create this new African citizen who will be the change of, the agent for change 
for this country's sustainable development. And we have sustainable development. We have indeed a 10-year plan on an African confidential education strategy for development. When we started off, the mission 16, uh, 2016 to 2025, we are now realizing that 2025 <coughs> is just seven months away. Universities, let me indulge me while I say that some of us and some of you still live in the ivory tower concept. You must, the president will agree with me, you must. And this university was set up to be a development-focused university, given demand-driven research. Why is this relevant? Because of the problems we are seeing in the creation of environmental issues and in the withholding of an enabling infrastructure to enable Ghana's natural wealth to be harvested and mined on a sustainable daily basis and to give hope to our small scale miners who are in every village in Ghana. The universities in Ghana should be considered as salvation places. All our problems, especially publicly funded universities, you must be able to resolve our problems and not be in ivory towers. Minerals mining presents the complicated challenges. We must deal with them. Ghana is now reduced to selling off our raw materials, our energy, and our mineral resources to be able to import grain and what? Toothpicks. Toothpicks in Ghana. Excellency. Excellency. Universities must become thought development agents. They must become the necessary linkage between education and economic development. In Africa, we are supposed to be the drivers of change. We are supposed to take the minds, the young minds, and mold them into what is becoming the global solution and the global breadbasket of the world. Even as I But we have to see that, Your Excellency, the Re Madam Registrar, Vice Chancellor, Chairman of the University Council. We have to see that coherent development model. We have to see that vision for taught education and taught knowledge translate directly into industrialization, translate directly into being sources of empowerment for our people. Universities, I will be bold to say this, should not, should not become citadels of partisan political activity as we have seen in the recent past in Ghana. Changing names of universities, institutions at will should not be allowed. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, our own Kofi Annan the late Secretary General of the UN, at a time strongly promoted for the importance of universities for development in Africa. And he clearly demonstrated, I think, his support coming from Ghana for the role of university education in development that we become at the university development. I think we have seen over the years, the past decade in particular, the excellence of Ghanaian universities attested to by the fact that we have hundreds if not thousands coming from neighboring countries to 
come and study in some of our reputable public universities, despite all the challenge. And this is due for me. I have lived for some years now, and when the late Professor Mills and then John Romani Mahama, His Excellency, there, when they always prioritized the expansion and strengthening of the university education of Ghana. John Dramani Mahama also prioritized technological capture and the improvement of the ability of Ghana to maximize her economic output. This university, the establishment of this university, is testimony to that effect in particular. The prioritization of technical universities initiate, initiated under the John Ramani Mahama uh, government aims at the positioning of the universities beyond being a human capital resource and being able to direct solutions and create center and innovative hubs for our people to benefit, not only for students. We need to embrace we need to embrace the knowledge economy and the networks and also insist on seeing how the universities are going to provide a direct input. These are the challenges we believe with the university hierarchy here we must be able to maintain the access and quality of education, but you must also help those who are on the grounds and who are facing difficulties in uh, uh, participating in their chosen professions. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, it is widely held that university education contributes to social and economic development. We form human capital. We build knowledge bases. We disseminate and use knowledge. And we maintain the intergenerational and transmission of knowledge. But, but, what do we say about Ghana? Will our dear Ghana be able to compete in the knowledge of economy that is being globalized or are we going to be able to look forward as we have been looking forward to these last seven years an increasingly hopeless and helpless situation where even the academics are helpless in providing solutions to the problems that we face. What is the role then of this university in bridging the skill gap in natural resource development in Ghana. What are the major obstacles? I think um, the chairman of the council has given some major obstacles. How can they be overcome? Let me commend this university for introducing undergrad and postgraduate programs in sustainable, sustainable mining and urban mining. And we urge you to continue. Driving in here, we drove in from the Ashanti region. We saw some huge expansion work going on at some of the mining sites. And we realized that they were doing it in a holistic and, we hope, in an um, environmentally friendly uh, manner. New generation of mining experts are expected to embrace emerging digital technology real-time data acquisition, improved data analysis, uh, covering different aspects from explo exploitation, exploring, and all of that down to the end products of marketing. These must be captured in our new proposed Ghana mining vision. Small-scale mining is fundamental to our country's development. And I know that His Excellency is going to talk about that. So, Your Excellency, permit, permit me for one minute to preempt that as part of your vision 
for the Ghana mining sector and your contribution to the Ghana country mining vision. When we assume power on January, in January 2025, our first budget bill will be will capture in detail our government's proposed measures to strengthen mining, critical minerals, and research from 2025 onwards. I am certain that our government will make the necessary budgetary allocations and will also look at an establishment of a Ghana Mining Excellence Center. Excellency. Don't let me take up more time. The challenge is also for our, us in our great NDC to transform small-scale mining. To transform small-scale mining. I will leave our leader to detail his vision on that. But let me assure you, it is not, it is not a future characterized by ad hoc and mostly non-legal responses. It is not going to be a future characterized by unlawful seizure of properties, bullying, destruction of some of the most expensive equipment in the world, crippling the small-scale miner. We will bring you on board as small scale miners and you are the people that this university has pledged to support and you are the people who our government has pledged to, to support. I want to thank you and to wish you a wonderful week of transformational dialogue. Thank you. Another round of applause for Mrs. Betty Mo Didrisu, former Minister of State in charge of education. Thank you so very much. Um, I've had the opportunity to talk about how I listen to politicians when they speak. Uh, Your Excellency, as journalists, we have devised strategies that we use to listen to politicians and to pick out sound bites whenever politicians address us at public fora such as this. There are certain phrases we always look out for, Auntie. Once we find those phrases in the speech of a politician, we, we doubt everything you have said as a politician. In the absence of any of those phrases or words, we know that you have spoken nothing but the truth. Now, what are these phrases or words? First, when we are listening to politicians as journalists, and we hear you say anywhere in your speech that it is in the pipeline, we, we take it with a pinch of salt. Then, as you proceed, you then announce that plans are far advanced. No, 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 no. We know no. This one would not take it with a pinch of salt. In fact, we would take it with a ladle of salt. Then ultimately, a the politician addresses you and gives you hope by saying that there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's no tunnel at all. <laughs> but Auntie Betty, as you were speaking, I listened to you and I listened with rapt attention and with cocked ears. You did not make empty promises. You did not speak about anything being in the pipeline. You did not tell us plans being far advanced. Neither did you give us false hope by telling us that there was light at the end of the tunnel. In fact, you spoke the truth. Let's give her a round of applause one more time. We have to you. Oh, is that all you can do? I want to hear applause. Or we'll pause here so that the message can sink in. And as we allow the message to sink in, we we'll invite, in fact, before I invite the cultural troop, let me acknowledge the presence of uh, our distinguished 
and revered chiefs who are here with us. Nana Adai Krang is the Simpi Tiffany Hine. He's here with us, and please do forgive me. Uh, it's a sheet that has been given me. I do not see all the writing here. Nana Adai Kuntuma, the fourth, is the Sunyai Nifahini. He's here with us. Nana Ata Amponsa, Sunyai Mpunya Hine is here with us. Nana Dr. Agba Jaga, the third, is here with us. We are very grateful. Nana Yao Sapon is the Ahafo in Kesim Sapon Hine. He's here with us. Oji Ahoho Kran Asimpi Jase Hine is here with us. Uh, Nana Kwesio Poku Mori Bidetu the second Chidom Hine is here with us. We are very, very grateful to all of you. And then we have also been joined by Dr. Asa Muhammad. Uh, he is representing the Vice Chancellor of the University, the CK Tedam University of Technology and Applied Sciences. We are grateful for your presence. Uh, it, I mispronounced the name of uh, Professor Bechi Isedu of the School of Natural Resources, also here with us. Uh, Dean, we are very grateful to you. I humbly invite the cultural troupe to give us a performance for just five minutes and then we'll get back to the event. Thank you.
Excellency, I went up there during the performance to perform some of my duties and a young lady of about 13 years old says her dream is to take a picture with you and that as MC I should announce that she's looking for that opportunity. I want to tell you sir. So uh, students from the mining communities, the basic school students, raise your hand and wave the former president. He will take a picture with you at the tail end. Are you happy? No, I can't hear. Yeah, are you happy? Uh, okay, thank you very much. And you have to acknowledge and appreciate that one student who has made this appeal on your behalf. We are very grateful to you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll listen to our next speaker. Our next speaker is a former CEO of the Minerals Commission, but and then also the Ghana Chamber of Mines. Currently, he is the president. Indeed, he's also the founder of the Africa Institute of Extractive Industries. Let's give a round of applause to Dr. Tony Aubin. Thank you very much. His Excellency, the former President of the Republic of Ghana, and we all agree that the prefix former is going to be former in the next eight years. I say eight years, eight months. Please, eight months. The eight years is in the pipeline, but the eight month is the truth. So, yes. <laughs> So, um, and the President, permit me to stand on the previous protocols just to avoid a slope of forgetting some names. I hope you have permitted me. Um, but also, permit me to start on a light note. Uh, when someone was invited to give a keynote address, and this man didn't know what the keynote address was. So, he thought of something. He looked for a key and then a notebook and had an envelope. He wrote an address behind it. So he came standing like this and said, audience, you see, this is the key. This is my notebook. And of course, I have addressed it to the University of Environment and Natural Resources. So that's the keynote address. So, but, 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 on a serious note, I must say that it's a great honor and privilege to speak at this third transformation dialogue organized by this great university. Um, I need not talk more about the importance of the theme and even the topic generally. I am required to direct my speech on the values, expected ambitions, that is outcomes and modalities towards the composition of a Ghana country vision. Let me say up in issue that the call to craft a country's vision on mining is not new. And as the uh, council chair has already said, in August 2008, the African Union and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, UNECA, set up a technical task force to prepare an appropriate response to the governance and management challenges that African countries face in transforming their economies using natural resources as catalysts. The resultant document from the technical task force after a year of dedicated work was a set of principles based on best practices and lessons from the continent's decades of resource extraction. And of course, they also looked at best practices and lessons from the continent's decades of uh, resource extraction. The document became the African Mining Vision. The African Mining Vision was intended to be Africa's own response 
to tackling the paradox of poverty in the midst of plenty. Great mineral wealth existing side by side with pervasive poverty. In fact, after all, when the certain man said, he meant this exactly that. That we have a lot of gold, we have a lot of natural resources, yet a common The cardinal objective was to create a transparent, equitable, and uh, optimal exploitation of mineral resources to underpin broad based sustainable growth and socioeconomic development. This vision was adopted by the EU heads of states at their February summit uh, in 2009. And I would guess that our president, uh, the late Professor Tamils, was part of this. And uh, as a sequel to it, all natural resource dependent member states were enjoined to articulate their respective national mining visions. What role they expect their minerals to, uh, mineral resources to play in their economies and the expected contribution of mining to their national development agenda. The essence is to afford member states the opportunity to fashion our strategies to interrogate the current status and integrate their natural resources into the rest of the national economy and through that make that critical sustainable paradigm shift from the enclave nature of resource extraction. Again, the document imposed an obligation on Africans to think outside the box. In response to that requirement, Ghana developed its first comprehensive mining policy under the direction of President John Dramani Mahama. So under his direction, we developed and completed a national mining policy in 2014. In fact, that was the first comprehensive national mining policy for Ghana ever. In fact, this policy provided significant background information to the attempt by Ghana to develop its own Ghana country mining vision. So that effort started in 2015 under the leadership of uh, President Mahama and uh, I mean uh, through the collaboration of UNDP and the Minerals Commission. Of course, we say in this part of the world that Fofia and Tuata, that is why uh, Pro Professor Council Chair says that up to now we don't have a Ghana mining vision. Perhaps if President Mahama had been there, we would have had the country mining vision by now. However, let me say that even the country mining policy, which in this situation we might say that country's vision on mining had about five pillars. They were you know, formed under about five pillars. First, to leverage the mining sector to drive economic growth, create jobs, and generate revenue for the country. Second, to promote responsible mining practices that minimize environmental impact, protect biodiversity, and promote reclamation and rehabilitation of mining sites. Third, to prioritize the well-being and rights of local communities affected by mining activities, promoting community engagement, consultation, and ensuring equitable sharing of mining benefits. Fourth, strengthening governance and regulatory frameworks, monitoring and enforcement mechanism to ensure compliance with laws and regulations in the mining sector. And finally, to foster collaborations and partnerships between government, industry, civil society, 
and local communities to achieve sustainable mining development. Your Excellency, the Ghana's country policy was built, I mean, the ideals were quite lofty and ambitious. It, it promised to harness the potentials of the mining industry to drive economic growth, create jobs, and contribute to sustainable development were spot on. However, despite these lofty objectives, there are, there, there are significant drawbacks which indeed need to be addressed if we were to craft an improved mining vision, as we are trying to do now. For the sake of time, I will just address a few of them and then we'll move on. First, despite having re regulations in place, there have been instances of poor enforcement leading to environmental degradation, water pollution, loss of biodiversity, and smuggling of minerals. These are things that we know, in spite of the existence of this lofty vision. Second, the promise to integrate mining to local economy, including the articulation of various linkages for industrialization, remains to be seen. Um, in spite of good, you know, a few good successes chalked in the area of local content. I think there's more that mining can do in terms of integrating into the economy. Similarly, the prevalence of illegal mining, as we know, known as Galamsey, poses a, a significant challenge to the country's mining vision. Thousands of unregulated mining operations are spread across the country. And I come from the Western region. Uh, and in the Western region alone, there's an estimated 11 thousand small scale, well, uh, let me see, I don't know how to call it, whether small scale mining or Galamse, uh, <laughs> something, 11,000. Uh, because they are not registered, they are bordering Galamse. Because as a former uh, commissioner of the Minerals Commission, I, uh, I know that we had only 2,000 or so registered small scale miners. So if you have thousand spots operating, your guess is as good as mine. Now, um, the sprawling mining activities continue to contribute to deforestation, water pollution, and loss of biodiversity, threatening the long-term sustainability of Ghana's natural resources. And yet, it deprives the government of the much-needed revenue from the mining sector. In fact, a study that has been conducted actually reveals significant loss of revenue to government as a result of the unregulated nature of small-scale mining. You can imagine that uh, in 2021, um, I think 2020 or so, production of gold from the small-scale mining sector uh, was about 30 percent or more. So if you, and, and out of the small miners, only a few few registered small scale mining make some contribution in terms of red, uh, uh, taxes. The rest, free bone too. So you can calculate the percentage, even if it's 5%, you can calculate what is lost. So that is quite significant. Now the Galamse operations, as far as their potential to create uh, jobs, do not only operate in defiance of the law and regulation uh, of the country, they constitute a major source of dangerous and unsightly environmental degradation and health and even security risks for local communities in the country. Some people are saying that Ghana has been so lucky Boko Haram hasn't been able to come here. Because rather than come and destroy Ghana, they will use Ghana to generate money. So if they have some people producing gold via the illegal means, then of course they, they supply them with revenue rather than come to attack us. I don't know whether we shouldn't allow Galamse to go on so that Boko Haram wouldn't come here. And that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's just on the side. Similarly, despite the significant revenue generated from mining activities as a whole and the promise of economic development and transformation, there has been a lack of investment in infrastructure, education, and healthcare in mining areas. In fact, until recently, one of the key features of mining areas was bad roads. This paradox is quite interesting. In the past, 
they used to be where cocoa, wherever you had cocoa, there was cocoa road. That name changed. But cocoa roads were the bad roads in Ghana. Oh, that road, yes, cocoa road. Then it's a bad road. Until the name changed under, under the ND, uh, NDC government, uh, the last NDC government, where specific action was taken to change that. Same was for gold roads. If you are going to a mining area, those of you who know Tapa, Damai, and all those here, it was only recently that uh, you know the roads were made a bit better. That's why people say, ah, go to Johannesburg and compare that to Takwa or Obwasi. Of course, I am not part of that school because Johannesburg and Takwa may not be comparable. But it's very important that those who host our natural resources from which we make our, our, our revenues and, and foreign exchange and whatever must also bear the positive side of it, not only the negative side. Furthermore, there, there have been concerns about transparency in the mining sector with limited information on mining revenues and how they are used to benefit local communities despite our membership of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. These, among others, underscore the need for a revised, more robust mining vision. After all, the first one was our first attempt. But at the heart of any effort to address the drawbacks and create a more effective mining vision for Ghana lies the values we hold dear as Ghanaians. Our values must guide us in every decision we make especially when it comes to something as critical as mining, which not only impacts our economy, but our environment, our communities, and our future generations. Our values of integrity, transparency, sustainability, inclusivity, and legality must be the cornerstone of any approach to couch a new mining vision. Our ambition must be high and tall, and yet attainable. We must envision a mining sector that contributes significantly to Ghana's economic growth with, while preserving our natural heritage and, among, and also improving the livelihood of our people. We should aspire to create framework where responsible mining practices are not just encouraged, but enforced where the benefits of mining are shared equitably among all sh shareholders I mean stakeholders and where the negative impacts are mitigated effectively. We must envision a well-governed mining sector where all mining operations, no matter how small, are registered, regulated, and monitored to ensure compliance with environmental and safety standards. The vision must aim a stronger enforcement of mining and environmental regulations, increased investment in local communities, addressing the legacy impact of the seemingly intractable uh, challenge of illegal mining. I think any government, and, and, and that's where NDC government has a big task of remedying the uh, legacy impact. These days you walk around, nobody should tell you our, uh, 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 what do you call it, our forests have been opened, lands destroyed, and all that. So that, that has to be done. We need to ensure transparency. And uh, we ensure that uh, things are done better than before. Now, but these challenges sometimes get exacerbated by politics and politicians. Um, when you go to our forests, our forest today, most of them are being mined. And I can put my last, and I'm left with just 25 cities. I can put my last 25 cities that all those areas being mined would be politicians, either by proxy or directly doing it. If I'm lying, somebody should tell me. When you go to the forest, I'm not even talking about a normal place, but the forest areas, who will be allowed to go to the forest to mine if you are not powerful? So, so it, it, it really makes the fight against illegality very difficult. When a, an ordinary person is trying to register, 
um, a politician walks into a forest, just have a, a feeling that this place is a very, or maybe information, that this place may be very prolific in some manner, and then start mining. Nobody stops that. So I think that's, again, one of our biggest challenges. Um, Your Excellency, permit me to spend a few minutes on a vision for small-scale mining. I just outlined a vision for mining generally. Uh, uh, but let's look at what we envision small-scale mining to be. Um, at the outset, I must, I must admit that as a country, we cannot do away with small-scale mining. Any, I, I, I met someone who said, ah, but why don't we stop this small-scale mining at all? I said, you are crazy. We, we can't stop small-scale mining in this country. It has never been stopped anywhere in this world where these minerals exist. They are a source of significant wealth and livelihoods of over a million Ghanaians. What we need to do is to convert the myriad of illegal operators to operate legally, which is a challenge though. Unfortunately, and as it, is, it has become more and more evident, I've already indicated some political elites have become more assembling help for uh, this challenge. I, I recall a statement made at Obuasi some time ago that when a case may die, may be galante and then later on, the politicians also have to change their minds. You know, a vision for small-scale mining subsector must prioritize environmental stewardship, ensuring that mining activities are conducted in a manner that preserves our natural heritage for, for the future. We should include all the stakeholders uh, and in, in crafting such a vision, we must also include civil society organizations, academia, it should be broadly. You cannot sit in your room and draft action for, for small-scale miners. We must have a small-scale mining system where um, access to capital is not a hindrance. That small-scale miners can access capital. We, we must make it easy for small-scale miners to formalize themselves. I have said there's a difference between formalization and, and uh, legalization. They are brothers, but there's a bit of a difference. Sometimes formalization is just recognizing that they are there, having structures, but I've, I've, I've led that effort before. When I used to work as a miner, I, I used to be in charge of small-scale miners in a place where they were illegal by, by our, our definition. So what we did was to organize them. We gave them cards, you know, uh, so they put the badge in front of them, their, their, their pockets. They go, and we had one mining engineer working with them. They wanted the company to buy the gold. They said, no, no, no. Take your gold. We don't want you tomorrow to say that the company is cheating us. So they were formalized. They were not legalized. That was one step towards uh, maybe legalization. So we must introduce formalization. Uh, using the military uh, as a regular effort to stop, we know it. It is, it is not sustainable. It has never been sustainable anywhere. Um, you have to have technology, reduce human impact to do that. Now, let me just end my long talk because I'm sure some of the comments will be given to the university and I'm sure the details will be there. Um, in conclusion, let me reiterate my deep appreciation to the organizers of this dialogue. As a resource endowed country, charting Ghana country mining vision is not a mere technical exercise. It is a moral imperative. It is a moral imperative. It is, there, it is uh, about defining the kind of country we want to be and the legacy we want to leave for the future. Let us seize the opportunity to chart a course towards mining sector that is not only prosperous, but also ethical, sustainable, and inclusive. Let us together turn our aspiration into reality and build a brighter future uh, for a Ghana that we all want. We should build a brighter future together for, for Ghana that we all want. Thank you so much.
Thank you. God bless us all. Dr. Tony Orbin deserves another round of applause. Your Excellency, the man who is the foundation patron of TAIN here at the University of Energy and Natural Resources on the Doma campus, Dr. Jacob Anankwari is here. Doc, thank you very much. You founded TAIN on the UNER campus. Um, we have now Dr. Agba Jaga the third representing the Yagunwura here at this forum. Let's give him a round of applause. He was asked by the Yagunwura to represent him here. Ladies and gentlemen, I am about to introduce the distinguished guest of honor on this occasion. After I'm done with a little introduction, our cultural troupe will then step in to properly invite him in the traditional manner to speak with us. Our guest speaker is a man who has seen it all in his political career as an MP, as a deputy minister, as a substantive minister, as vice president, and as president. He is the fourth president under the Fourth Republic of Ghana, and hopefully, very soon, he will become the sixth president under the Fourth Republic of Ghana. Before I invite the cultural troop to invite him, I also wish to state that on a personal level, this man helped to improve my CV. As a journalist, when you get to interview a president and a former president, exclusively, it means a lot. This man allowed me access to his home. And out of his busy schedule, he gave me two precious hours of his time just to speak to him one-on-one. -on -one. And that tells you the humility of the man we're about to introduce. His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. Let's give a round of applause. But first, Council Chairman, uh, Professor Kwesi Isia Yaba, and also to recognize our traditional uh, rulers, and also Prof. Akudubu, who is the main driver behind this uh, transformation dialogue. And uh, let me continue on established protocol. And just distinguished guests, uh, my brothers and sisters. I'll also start with an icebreaker um, on keynote speeches. And um, there was this guy who was invited to give a keynote, one of the keynote address addresses. There were several of them who were giving keynotes. And um, this was particularly very long. And so as he kept talking, people started leaving the hall one after the other. And um, when he got to in conclusion, there was only one person left. Everybody had left. And so he finished his conclusion and then he put the microphone down, walked up to the guy who was left and asked him, why did you stay? Everybody left while I was giving the lecture. And he says, because I'm the next speaker after you. A 
And so the only reason he didn't leave was he was supposed to speak after him. Everybody else had gone. And so I'll make this mercifully short so that uh, you all don't uh, abandon me in this hall. Ladies and gentlemen, annual transformational dialogue on small-scale mining. Mining has been and will continue to be a significant contributor to our nation's uh, economy. As urgently acknowledge that illegal mining, which is popularly referred to as Galamse, has posed a severe and immediate threat to our environment, our health, and our economy. We cannot afford to watch as our natural resources are plundered and our communities continue to suffer the consequences. We cannot afford to watch, okay, Ghana is blessed with abundant natural resources, including gold, and has experienced the devastating effects of illegal mining firsthand. Our rivers and lands have been polluted, our forests have been destroyed, our people have been left without clean water. Our lands have been degraded. We cannot allow illegal mining to continue unchecked. We must chart a new vision for our country's mining industry that prioritizes sustainable development and responsible mining practices. We must look to both local Ghanaian examples and global incidents to inform our approach to curb illegal mining. Illegal mining is not peculiar only to our country, and there are global best practices that we can borrow from. In our own country, we have witnessed the destruction caused by illegal mining in places like the Berem River, the Ancobra, and the Pra Rivers. We have seen the devastation caused by illegal mining in many of our forest reserves, including the Etiwa Forest Reserve, which is known to be a home to endangered species and is vital to our country's water supply. We cannot afford to lose these precious natural resources to the greed of a few individuals. Internationally, we've seen the tragic consequences of illegal mining in places like Brazil, where the recent collapse of a dam at an illegal mining site resulted in the loss of hundreds of lives. To address these challenges, we must work together, including all of you, to develop and implement policies that prioritize sustainable mining practices and hold those who engage in illegal mining accountable. This will require a multifaceted approach that includes stricter enforcement of mining laws increased investment in responsible mining technologies, and enhanced efforts to educate and empower small-scale miners to operate sustainably. We must also prioritize preserving our environment and protecting our natural resources for future generations yet unborn. This means us taking bold steps to rehabilitate and restore areas affected by illegal mining and investing in renewable energy sources to reduce our reliance on traditional mining practices. As the leader of the National Democratic Congress, I'm deeply committed to working with all stakeholders when we come into government to chart a new vision for our country's mining industry. We must ensure that Ghana's natural resources are managed, managed to benefit all our people and not just a few. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Council Chairman, the small-scale mining sector plays a significant role in our economy and provides livelihoods for millions of our people and is contributing to the development of our nation. It has been both a bedrock of livelihood for many and a source of considerable environmental and safety concerns 
as well as concern about illegal mining activities. Today, the sector stands at the crossroads, and the decisions we make or fail to make and the actions we take or fail to take will determine its role in our nation's future. As a nation, we cannot fail to recognize the significant contribution of small-scale mining to our economy. And as I said, it's estimated to provide em employment to over one million Ghanaians and serves as a crucial source of income in many of our rural areas. However, the environmental impact of unregulated mining activities has been profound, negatively affecting our water bodies, our lands, and our forests. I'm dedicated to supporting the transformation of small-scale mining, and my vision in this regard is very clear. The NDC, which I lead, will aim to reform small-scale mining into a better regulated, environmentally responsible, and economically viable sector. You'll all agree with me, ladies and gentlemen, that we can develop the sector into one that contributes to our economy in a sustainable manner while respecting our environmental heritage. Over the past seven years, small-scale miners in this country have endured enough government mishandling of the sector, such as equipment confiscation, burning of excavators, and in some cases, the loss of lives of innocent Ghanaians. Ladies and gentlemen, let me share with you a few of what I intend to do in this sector. That is some key policy proposals and initiatives we will implement to help us achieve what should be a sustainable, responsible, and prosperous small-scale mining sector. Firstly, we propose the establishment of district mining offices in all mining districts of the country. So it means that every district in which mining takes place will have an office of the Minerals Commission, the Environmental Protection Agency, and all the other agencies uh, associated with mining. These offices will be staffed by officers from the Minerals Commission, the EPA, and other agencies related to the mining sector. These offices will usher in a new era of transparency and efficiency, streamlining the application process for mining licenses and fostering hope and prosperity among small-scale miners. To support these efforts, we plan to amend the Minerals and Mining Act to grant district mining offices a greater role in the process of issuing mineral licenses. So as a small scale miner, you won't need to always travel to Accra to the Minerals Commission head office. You will have a Minerals Commission office in your district and they will be responsible for supervising your activities. This decentralization of much of the process for licensing would increase the number of regulated small-scale mining companies and thereby boost youth employment, particularly under our 24-hour economy policy. As part of our broader economic transformation model and a burning commitment for creating more sustainable and decent jobs for the Ghanaian youth, my administration intends to ensure the active involvement of mining engineers and related specialist graduates from the University of Mines and Technology and the University of Energy and Natural Resources, Sunyani, in the small-scale mining sector. And so these district mining offices and EPA offices and all the other agencies will be, man will be manned by graduates coming from uh, UMAT and uh, UNER. These graduates will be attached to the newly created district mining offices and they will also be attached to small scale mining companies. And so if you have a small scale mining lease, you will have a graduate from one of these universities supervising your mining and making sure that you're doing the right thing uh, on your mine.
This will introduce the best mining practices and thereby ensure the safety and sustainability of mining uh, uh, practices. These professionals will be attached to newly created mining district offices and to small-scale mining operators in order to provide them with guidance and support. One of the, we will establish a centralized buying mechanism for purchasing gold from small and medium-scale mining companies at competitive prices. This raw gold will be refined in order to add value to it before we export. We'll collaborate with the private sector to secure the necessary international certification for our refined gold for export. We know that one of the impacts of illegal mining has been the destruction of our forests and our cocoa farms. We'll prevent the destruction of cocoa farms from mining activity and effectively ban the issuance of entry permits into forests for mining purposes. We'll investigate the opaque gold for oil program and expose the actors benefiting from this. We'll investigate the opaque gold for oil program and expose the actors benefiting from this so-called barter agreement. Reports reaching me suggest that a new debt burden is being created because Ghana has not been able to keep up with its delivery of gold under the program. A portion of revenue from gold proceeds will be used to improve infrastructure and social services in mining communities. So wherever there's mining, we'll reinvest some of the revenue in improving infrastructure in those districts and in those communities. Recognizing the invaluable role of traditional leaders in our society, and as a testament to our commitment to inclusivity and respect for all stakeholders, my government intends to have traditional leaders included in the crucial process of granting mining licenses in their communities. We will strengthen regulatory institutions such as the Minerals Commission, the EPA, the Geological Survey Authority, and the Natural Resource Universities to further this. This will involve laws, policies, regulatory enforcement, and education. Miners will be made aware of the regulations and the reason for the regulations. They must be partners in this transformative process and not enemies. The aggressive approach adopted in recent times has proved unsustainable. That is using Galam Stop and military uh, uh, people to police Galam This has only helped worsen the fight against Galam and led to a situation where some political actors and their task force teams have profited from the arrangement. It is also my vision to reform the mining sector structurally. Ghana's small-scale mining sector is perhaps the only economic sector with only two categories. And the two categories are small-scale mining and large-scale mining. Some mines within what is currently classified as a small-scale category have grown beyond small. But at the same time, they are not large enough to qualify as large-scale. And so we'll structurally reform the entire mining sector through a comprehensive recategorization into small-scale mining, medium-scale mining, and large-scale mining. So there will be three categories of mining activity, and each will have specifically tailored operational, environmental, and safety requirements that they have to follow. Through these deliberate efforts, sector regulation will be much easier and more effective and support systems for miners, including access to legal mining sites, fair markets for selling their gold, and financial services would be enhanced. By providing a framework that supports legal mining practices, we hope to encourage compliance and deter illegal activities. Additionally, we will take deliberate and conscious policy steps to ensure that indigenous Ghanaian-owned companies wholly operate in the medium-scale mining and small-scale mining sectors. 
So these sectors will be reserved for Ghanaian companies. We will also implement shedding off for large scale concession holders. Um, if you are a large scale concession holder, we know that the gold occurs in different quantities in different parts of the concession. You have the core of the concession where you can have sometimes 8 grams per ton, 9 grams per ton. And you have other parts of the concession where you have 1 gram per ton. Normally, the large scale miners are interested in where there is a bigger concentration of the gold in the ore. And so they are not in a hurry to mine where it's one gram per ton or less than one gram per ton. We'll do what we call shedding off. And so the areas they are not interested in, we'll demarcate those areas and we'll put small scale mining companies on those shed off areas to be able to mine successfully. And we'll let them mine under the supervision of the large scale concession holder and the Minerals Commission, the EPA, and all the other regulatory bodies. Additionally, we will introduce and encourage technological in innovation to improve capacity for coordinated monitoring of the small scale and medium scale mining sectors in order to reduce the environmental impact. This will include using AI to locate all small scale mining and Galamse operations to be able to track excavators and geofence all concessions to ensure mining operations are not conducted in unapproved areas especially in water bodies when we talk about geofencing there's a technology that allows you to establish what we call virtual boundaries around a concession and so you can in real time see what is happening in the concession if an excavator enters you know an excavator has entered if an excavator leaves you know an excavator has left and everything that is being done in the concession, you can monitor it from the Minerals Commission office in real time. A special financing scheme will be established to provide capital and, min and mining equipment pools in each district where gold mining is prevalent. We're going to depend on the private sector for this to provide small scale financing and medium scale financing to the companies so that they can do their mining but only if you are legally mining and then we'll also create um, uh, pools where they have excavators they have bulldozers they have all the equipment you need for mining and so you can go and lease the equipment to work on your mine and when you finish you return the equipment back to the pool this will facilitate easy and affordable access to relevant mining equipment and let me emphasize, these services will be available for only companies that are engaged in lawful and regulated mining. To support all these brilliant initiatives and ensure that we're implementing them as best as possible, I've announced the launch of a Ghana Mining Excellence Center, which will be run initially for five years and will be coordinated by UNER and UMAT, the two universities will coordinate it. So there'll be a center here in UNER, there'll be a center in UMAT. And these centers will undertake research into mining activities for sustainable development. The way I envision these centers of excellence, they will collaborate with scientists from other universities worldwide to implement joint research and innovation projects that will stimulate green growth within the Ghanaian mining and minerals industry. This is informed by the thinking that research and evidence-based policies practice should be at the center of our mining vision. Therefore, the university research and innovation scale-up community should prepare and rise to the occasion when the time comes next year. In order to increase in order to increase the capacity of UNER and UMAT to produce first-class graduates for the mining industry, we will undertake a major upgrade of infrastructure in the two universities. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been established that community involvement in small-scale mining 
is crucial to its effective management. As we know, the African vision on mining is in favor of inclusivity. It's in favor of including uh, the indigenous people in the mining activity. It is therefore important to encourage the formation of mining cooperatives that allow community members interested in mining to organize themselves for the necessary governmental support to mine efficiently and sustainable. The proposed small-scale mining cooperatives we are talking about will differ in all forms from the existing community mining scheme, which, is undeniable, which has undeniably become a conduit for enriching party chairmen, DCs, and other politically connected individuals. Indeed, in my government, if you are a minister or a DC or an official and you undertake mining activity, I'll ask you to resign and go and do the mining. You either choose to be a public official or choose to be a business person running a, a mine. At the same time, we cannot overlook the years of Galamsey activities that have left our country with legacy scars. We propose some initiatives to restore degraded lands, rehabilitate impacted forests, and clean our polluted water bodies. These initiatives will restore the environment and create thousands of jobs in the affected mining communities. We will establish a reclamation fund which, into which all legal mining operators will contribute. So there will be a fund, a reclamation fund. If you own a mining concession, you will pay some money monthly into the reclamation fund. When you finish mining, if you use your own equipment, you level the ground, you reclaim the land nicely, we'll give you back your money. You take your money away. But if you don't reclaim the land, we will use that money to employ people in the community to reclaim the land, level it, and make it uh, available for uh, agriculture. So this fund will be utilized to rec reclaim all degraded lands after mining has been exhausted. This will provide jobs in water cleaning, land leveling, tree growing for many of the youth currently involved in illegal mining. So a lot of the young people who are currently involved in illegal mining, we will transition them into rather reclaiming land and growing trees on the degraded lands. We'll establish a national joint action team on mining and forestry, a collaboration between the Forestry Commission, the private sector, and the small-scale mining operators to rehabilitate impacted forest reserves. This initiative will create thousands of jobs in the affected mining communities. A Galamsey Rehabilitation Initiative will work to convert impacted lands into lands for commercial crop production, such as palm oil. We'll grow oil palm on the lands that we have reclaimed. We can grow cocoa on some of those lands. In the northern sector of the country, we can grow share nut trees, and um, we can also grow rubber on some of these degraded lands. This operation will be funded through the reclamation fees, green growth funds, carbon credits, and companies interested in plantation development. I will launch a Tree for Life project through which reforestation by young people in mining areas will become an economically engaging activity. They will supervise the growth of these economically viable tree crops and they will benefit from them. Through a Blue Water Initiative, the Water Resources Commission and the Ghana Water Company will partner with our development partners to clean the impacted water bodies. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, I urge you to join us in fostering dialogue among all stakeholders, including miners, environmental groups, local communities, and the government. It is only through open, honest, and inclusive dialogue that we can achieve lasting solutions and build a sustainable, responsible, and prosperous small-scale mining sector in Ghana. It is time for us to come together and take decisive action 
to end illegal mining and chart a sustainable future for our mining sector. I stand firm in this commitment and will work with you all to build the Ghana we want together. I thank you and may God bless our homeland Ghana. Thank you.